they had a little uh, little article in the paper where of me handing out the clothes at the park and my doing my real the guy followed me around on my routine. Mm -hmm. But um, I told you about when I slept out in front of the housing authority oh. and got my housing. That's mm -hmm. that that's actually the article that came out of that. And all, I put signs all over town, and the only one that showed up was my friend Chuck with his guitar. But that was great because it, it made it look like a big thing. <laughs> this one here is before I um, got housing, mm -hmm. and I lived in a shack at the landfill out there at, Al at the uh -huh. Albany landfill. And uh, that's my wife mm -hmm. before we had any kids. So I have quite a little uh, collection of things over the years. But yeah, so I'm still working with people that are on the streets. Um, you know, I, I put in most of my time doing that. And I raise my kids. So what was your personal experience with homelessness? Uh, when, I was, when I was about 20 years old, I was in a motorcycle accident. At the time I was working, I was going to school. You know, just the normal things you're doing at 20, just starting out in life, kind of. And um, I hit a, one of those green transformer boxes, mm -hmm. and I was doing about 90 miles an hour. And it tore my leg off, broke all my ribs, broke my, broke my clavicle. I have a steel plate here. My, my arm's wired up, and it's starting to fall apart really bad lately. But it lasted for a while. And I broke my pelvis in seven places. So basically, I was in really bad shape, and I was in... I was in a trauma unit for a month and a half, which is like unheard of. It's like the average stay in a trauma unit is like three days. Then either you die or you move up into intensive care. But I was actually there for a month and a half, and then I moved to intensive care. And a year, about a year and a couple of months later, 14 months, I, I was getting better to the point where I could move on into like rehab. When I first got there, that night a woman got boiled alive in a bathtub. And another man that had no legs fell out of bed, died, and they sent some people in to find out what was going wrong with the place, and they were finding people that had maggots in their wounds. I mean, it was just, a, the place smelled so bad. I went in there, I spent like five minutes in there, and I went outside, and I think I cried for about eight hours. I called around to different relatives that I, that I, my parents died when I was young, so I really didn't have anybody. So I called around to the few relatives that I did have, and they kind of ho and hummed, and you know, we'll come get you, we'll see what we can do, blah, blah, blah. But I couldn't stay there, there was just no way. And then a woman, while I'm out there in the parking lot, a woman from the news team comes up, and she interviews me about what's going on in there. So I tell her the truth, you know? And then when I go back inside, the guys, the guys are like, you know what, They're, they'll kill you in here. You know, you can't be talking like that to the news. They're, when that comes out on the news, they're you're a dead man. And so that kind of got me kind of scared. So I just said, I'm out of here. And so it was me and a pair of crutches, and I left. And I spent the next about 10 years on and off. Sometimes I would live with friends or something, but about a good 10 years as a homeless person. I ended up in People's Park. Um, the people there actually took care of me. You know, they would, you know, go get food for me, you know. People would drop off clothes and everybody would run. I can't run. So they'd grab clothes for me and bring them back. You know, so, and I really got attached to the people. One of the guys that went up there, his name was Bob Sparks. And he was an activist that came up and helped people at the park. And he told me, he goes, you know, if you're live, sleeping out here on the sidewalk, he goes, you know, I was telling him how I keep going to Social Security and they keep sending me a letter. Your condition will not last longer than a year. This goes on for 10 years. He goes, why don't you just go and sleep in front of the Social Security office? They're the ones that aren't paying you. And I go, wow, that's a pretty good idea. So I went to the Social Security office, and I slept out in front. And in the morning, when I opened the door up, I was the first one there. They'd open the door up. I'd go inside. I'd take number one. They'd call me. I'd go up there, can you check and see if anything's going on with my social security, you know, I'm having a hard time out here, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, she plays like, oh, here we go again. She typed in my name, you know, nothing yet, Mr. McMullen, like, okay, thank you. I'd go outside, wait a few minutes, come back in, number 13, come back in, number 42, can you check? And I would do this all day. So it went on one day, two days, three days. By the, by the end of the week, this is like five days of doing this, Friday, they all want to go home. I'm bothering, and was, you know, now I'm taking, you know, coming in every 15 seconds because I know they're going to be gone for the weekend, and I want to make sure I get in my, you know, they remember me. 
And so halfway through the day, the manager comes out. He goes, can I speak to you for a second? He brings me in the back and he goes, so tell me what's going on with you. And I tell him my whole story. And he looks, you know, I got, you know, I want an artificial leg all the way up to here. And, you know, I got this much leg left. You know, and I go, you know, this is all I got. I didn't even have an artificial leg. I had no medical care whatsoever. No pain medication. You know, that's one thing where they're going, all these people are drunks. You know, for some people, having two beards is the only thing that'll, you know, cure, you know, even put a dent in the pain you're in out there. And that's basically about what I was going through. And, and so, uh, you know, he goes, I can't believe this. He goes, he goes I'm going to go put through what's called a pre presumptive disability. I go, what's that? He goes, I just presume you're disabled. Let the paperboard catch up to you, and, uh, and we'll just put it through today. And I go, well, when will I get a check? He goes, I'll write, you'll, you'll get one today. And that was the first time I got any money in 15, I don't know, 13, 14 years. And, you know, that day I went up to the park. I bought all the people that were taking care of me new jackets. And uh, we had a little party. And um, it was just great. I mean, that, that was the start. And then I go, well, if that worked for the money, maybe it'll work for housing. So then I went to the housing authority and I got a big sign and I put it on the front and said, why are there so many disabled people on the streets in Berkeley? And I taped it to the front of the housing authority. And then I called the news and the news guy came out. He talked to me for a couple minutes. Then he goes, I'm gonna go in there and find out what's going on. And then he, come, he comes back out with the director of the housing authority. And they go, can you come in? And they gave me a voucher for housing that day. And that's how I got off the street. The Yes on S campaign says that Measure S is necessary due to a sudden influx of homeless youth. What are the facts surrounding homelessness in Berkeley? There aren't really that many young homeless people right now, but you know, I, I do my own little my own little test to see who's from where and why they're out there. Mm -hmm. And forty percent forty percent of homeless people are disabled people. Another thirty percent are kids that went through um, foster care and are just kind of like just let go when they're 18 and you know the rest of the rest of them are kind of like thrill-seeking kids that are out on a lark and or escaping some kind of abuse at home mm -hmm. you know so I you know the, the only way that the only way you can really you know bring those numbers down is to like one um, give kids that are in foster care longer care you know, like through college, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, to do a better job with people that are being abused at home. Mm -hmm. And three, take better care of homeless, uh, take care of the better care of disabled people. You know, every my my income has gone down every every few months. My income goes down, you know, 40 bucks here, 50 bucks there. You know, they cut my IHSS. They, every time that I get a cost of living increase, the state takes it away, you know, so, so my money's, you know, there, there could be come to a point where I could be out on the streets again, you know, it's really scary for me, you know, because it's not just me anymore, now I have children to worry about. Why do you think the Yes on S campaign promotes misconceptions about the homeless people of Berkeley? It's not a misconception, but it's a ploy. It's, there's, it's an election year. Okay, Tom Bates cannot go to the neighborhoods and get support from people in the neighborhoods because he's done nothing but screw over all the people in the neighborhoods. Uh, you know, so he, he has to go to the business people. And in order to go to the business people, he has to come up with something that he's got to give them something. Mm -hmm. So he goes, hey, you know what? I got this idea. It's only the fifth time we've done it in the last 10 years, but let's try it again. No sitting on the sidewalks, all right? We've already, they've already passed this law before. It went to the uh, California Supreme Court and was shot down. It's unconstitutional. Right. He knows that, all right? But it's a way for him to buddy up with the business people and because they're a new group. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a new group of business people. Right. They don't know all this. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they shell out the money so he can get all the pretty signs he puts up all over town. Mm -hmm. You know, he's not going to, he knows I'm not going to send him five bucks, mm -hmm. all right? I sent Chris 20 bucks. Before I was in my accident, I was one of those people, I voted for Reagan, okay? Reagan screwed me, okay? I, he's the one that cut the Social Security that I didn't get, okay? I, you know, I was like, you know, Reagan, yeah, get the hostages back. I remember those days. And, you know, and, and then I, 
But I was so stupid. I, you know, I was an idiot. I just had no idea of the bigger picture of what people go through, you know. Yeah, I'd see somebody on the sidewalk, I'd think, oh, get a job, you know, you're lazy, you're this, you're that. You know, I had all the same things that I hear other people say that piss me off now. Because I know better. You know, I know what, how you can end up out on the streets. It doesn't take much. You know, I was a strong 20-year-old person. I was a determined person. I worked my entire life. I worked... When I was a kid, I was, I was a model for Macy's and Gimbel's. I was making money when I was 10 years old. I was making money when I was 6 years old. Right? I started mowing lawns and doing, doing landscape when I was 12 years old. I've always worked in my life. I love to work. You know, that's one of the reasons I do all the work I do now is because I, could not, I couldn't stand to sit in this house all day. It would drive me crazy not to have something to do or some kind of work to do. And, you know, so it's not because I'm lazy, it's because I was wounded and hurt and in a position where I couldn't do anything. Other people would, you know, they get their backpacks on, they go up and sleep in the hills. I couldn't do that. I had to sleep on the sidewalk. I couldn't walk up that hill. There's just no way. You're saying, you being on the sidewalk is having too much. Things need to be worse for you. But let me tell you, when you sweep people off out of the picture, then you, we don't need to help anybody, do we? Because everything looks fine around here. You know, when the per we see the person sitting on the sidewalk, then you go, hey, you know, maybe we need to do something about this. But when you sweep the person off the sidewalk, then everything's kosher, right? You don't have to worry about a thing. And, you know, that's, that's the whole reason I'm against S. You know, I want my kids to see the person on the sidewalk. I want them to know that there are people that need help and that there are things that we need to do and that society is unfair and they do... And they, and, and they do turn their backs on the, on the people that need it the most. I went down Shattuck the other day, and I took a picture of every single person that was sitting on the sidewalk. I didn't pass anybody up because they didn't fit my idea of what I wanted to show people. I took a picture of every single person. I took a picture of the first man I took a picture of was a, was a person, and my wife was with me, and she said, Oh, that's John so-and-so. He's lived here his entire life. He, my, wife went, my wife was born in Berkeley, so she knows everybody. Her, my wife's mother was born in Berkeley. My wife's mother's mother was born. You know, she go, they go way back in Berkeley, all right? And she goes, that guy, I went to elementary school with him. And, you know, there he is, completely busted up on the sidewalk in Berkeley, all right? This guy didn't come to Berkeley to, you know, take advantage of the non-services they keep talking about, all right? The next person was some young kid, uh, I hate to say kid, but a young person, that was making jewelry, not asking anybody for anything. Just if you like the kid's jewelry, you could stop by and say, hey, that's nice, how much for that? And you could buy it from him. The next person was somebody that was painting. You know, the next person was this guy who was making the coolest patches. I wish I had some money, I would have bought one. And, um, and this was the same all the way down. So it was like five people that were actually making something and selling it, and one person that was severely disabled. And that was all there were out there. You know, when, when you go through something like that and, you know, hundreds of thousands of people walk by me, hundreds of thousands, millions of people walk by me, and nobody stopped and said, hey, is there anything I can do for you? You know, a few people did. Don't get me wrong. There's good people out there. But the people that really helped me were the other people that were, in, that were going through the same thing that I was going through. And there's no way that I'm going to let somebody help me like that and not help them in return. There's just no way. You know, I, I owe that to them. So, you know, when I go out there, you know, people, you know, pat you on the back, oh, you're such, good, you're such a good man, you're, I can't believe you do all this work for people. You know, I do that because I owe that. You know, I owe that to them. Instead of Measure S, what could Berkeley do to improve business? The whole thing about people sitting around is that people sit around because there's something interesting there. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting place. But now they go up there, and there's nothing there, and they keep driving, and they go somewhere else. They don't even stop. Because there's no scene anymore. And everybody wonders, why is business so bad? Because you have these idiots, uh, you know, the big guy, uh, Roland Peterson, I think his name is, the TAA, and um, the guy at the Med, uh, Craig Becker. They have no idea what the dynamics of Telegraph are. Now, the guy that owns... Blondies 
and Rasputin's and all those other stores that are up there. That's made, he's, he's a multi, multi-millionaire. He agrees with me. He goes, yeah, they're ruining the entire scene at Telegraph and it's killing business. He agrees with me. And who would know better about Telegraph than him? He's made, a million, he's made himself a millionaire. He started off with a little stand on the street then went in and sold used records in a little shop and then turned it into a huge empire on Telegraph and he's the only one up there making any money because he understands what Telegraph's all about. He don't want to chase the people off the streets. So, you know, I just, it's frustrating for me, you know, because there's so many things that we could do to make Telegraph and downtown better for everybody, for the people that are out there, to the, to the people that want to shop. And we're just not doing it. We wonder why the business is so bad in Berkeley. All they do is trumpet about how bad it is. You know, if you read the paper and you, and, you, and you kept reading about, you know, sitting law needs to be in Berkeley, all this bad stuff, blah, 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 blah. Would you go, hey, let's go to Berkeley this weekend? Hell no. They're, you know, they it's their own mental crap that they're pulling that's ruining Berkeley. You know, I, I was talking to... Uh, Mark, at me, he owns Amoeba Records, and um, and you know I'm thinking about next year start having a uh, a competition, a street street musician competition, where you know we put up a big prize and you know invite people from all over the world to come and you know try to win the prize as the best street musician. Now doing things like that, that would be what what Berkeley's all about to Berkeley, and it's something nice. And something fun, you know. You could do. There's so many things like that that we could do to make it better than passing these stupid laws that make it worse. You know, stop all the negative. Start, you know, accentuate the positive, and you know, and give up all that negative stuff. Get rid of those clowns you got running the TAA and all this. They're it, they're complete idiots. They have no idea. You know, put let me run the TAA for a year and see what happens. I'd have Telegraph Hoffman. Business would be tripled, quadrupled. You know, stores would be opening up all over the place. People would go, "Wow, things are happening over there." But you know, the way they're doing it, you know, no, who wants to go up there? It's a ghost town up there. You know, what are you gonna do? Every time it get, every time it gets worse, they do the same thing that made it worse in the first place. You know, and so, you know, get a new mayor, someone that has some imagination. If passed, how will Measure S impact Berkeley? Even if they say it's not for, we're not doing it to, to go after a certain people, human nature is to go after the person that's bothering you. And who's, is the guy that's rich and with shopping bags in his hand bothering you? No, you don't want to make it uncomfortable for him. You want him to keep shopping. But the guy that's sitting there with his, you know, with his little puppy and his girlfriend, uh, you know, with the dreadlocks, does he bother you? Well, maybe for some people that bothers them. And especially for police types. They go, hey, I don't like that guy. I don't like his looks. Let me go over there. It gives me a reason to, one, get his ID. You know, two, search all his stuff. You know, write him a ticket. Get him going to court. Hopefully, he'll miss court, get a warrant. Then when I really want to get him off the streets, I just go up. I already know his name because I got his ID. I go, oh, it's Bob so-and-so. And his warrant's out. Let's get rid of him. Yeah, when I was homeless, I was ticketed a lot. I got a lot of tickets and went to jail a lot. Um, it, was just, it was a nightmare. Court is hard to go to even if you are like live in a house and have a car and you got to be there at 9 o'clock and take the day off and blah, blah, blah. You know? But just think when you don't even have a watch. You know what I mean? And when you get so many tickets, you can't even keep track of them anymore because they're, you know, they got tickets for being in the park too late, tickets for, you know, smoking downtown. They didn't have those back then, but they had plenty of them. They call them, you know, if you had a, if they caught you with a backpack, they would say you were lodging, so they would give you a lodging ticket. And, um, I mean, what, what is that? 647J. I can even, I can. I can remember the number I got so many times. And this was even back then, we had a court here in Berkeley mm. that you could go to. If they were in Oakland, I would have never got to court. Forget about it, you know. But even in Berkeley, every now and then one slips by you. You just forget. And it's not like you're going to get something at the house that says, hey, you got court on such and such a day, because you don't have an address to pick up the, anything that gets sent out. 
So, you know, yeah, I had a lot of tickets. I, I did a, went to jail a lot for not going to, you know, court for tickets. Do you feel that the local government is concerned about your human rights? When I need something done, I don't call my, my, my councilman, Daryl Moore, all right? He's worthless, okay? That guy will never call you back. We'll never do, I, caught him, I talk to him face to face. I go, hey, you know what? We have this thing here where there's street sweepers and they come by. Mm -hmm. And if you don't move your car, they give you a ticket, 80 bucks, okay? I don't drive, I have someone that drives me. So if the, my driver doesn't come, my car gets stuck out there and I can't do anything about it. I tell people, please, please, I'm sorry. They give me the ticket anyway. I lost two cars because once they give you the tickets, you can't register your car. So I've lost two cars that way. I lost my I lost my little motorhome that I bought because I was getting we went through three foreclosures and I was so scared I was going to end up on the streets with my kids that I bought a little motorhome. I lost that. Okay, and there's some in the richer parts of town there are no street sweeper signs. You can park your car forever. Right. So it's just down here in the ghetto that we have to put up with that. And it's uh, and that's what it's made for. It's, it's made to get rid of poor people's cars. Because people that have money, they just pay the stupid 80 bucks. They don't care. You know what I mean? I can't afford it. 80 bucks is a lot of money to me. It's a ton of money. You know, it's like lights or pay for the $80 ticket. You know, I got two kids to raise here. I'm not gonna keep them in the dark. You know, they're gonna have water. They're gonna have food. They're gonna have lights. And if I have to lose my car, fine, but I'm not going to take it sitting down, you know, I'm going to be fighting that one. I like Tom Bates. I've known Tom Bates a long time. I've been to his home. I know his wife. His wife's done great things for me and helped me in, in the past. I voted for her. Uh, but, but you know, he, is he, he just doesn't have the imagination it takes. He's been hanging around with too many of these rich developers mm -hmm. that have no idea about what really goes down what's really going down on the ground level, mm -hmm. you know. When he first ran for uh, mayor, I got him to come out and sleep with the homeless people. I thought that, I thought maybe, you know, we could work together, you know, and in, in the beginning it seemed like we were going to work together. And then he just start. he went way over onto the other, onto the dark side. You know, he's running around with Darth Vader. And, you know, that's not going to do for Berkeley. Berkeley's not that kind of town. Hopefully, I pray. Is a human rights framework applicable in the No on S campaign? You know, I see on the news all the time, uh, people saying, oh, these people are getting foreclosed on, it's horrible, it's terrible. These people that are getting foreclosed on are out here on the sidewalk right now, okay? But they don't care about that. I don't hear anybody saying, hey, you know, we got to do something for these people. Once they hit the sidewalk, they turn into a whole different type of human being, or even if they're human at all, they're just a completely different animal. You know, the person being foreclosed on is a human being. The person that's been foreclosed on becomes some lower type of creature that really doesn't qualify as a human being anymore. And I think that's pretty sad. We have this program in Berkeley called Options. I, it's not really a program, it's programming. And it's programming people to stay out of Berkeley, basically. You know, it used to be somebody would get caught, have, get a ticket for having a beer, they go to the, they go to court. They say okay, and they would be over with. But now they put them on three years probation, and they send them to this lady, Dr. Cody, who was talking the other day, again, uh, for Measure S. And of course, she's for Measure S. That's her bread, bread and butter. Mm -hmm. She'll she'll start a program for people that sit. There was a guy. His name was Kevin Freeman. He sat right in front of Shakespeare's books on Telegraph. He was the most mellowest person you'd ever want to meet. They sent him to jail for 90, first they told him to stay, that he couldn't go on Telegraph. Telegraph was all he knew. So of course he went back to Telegraph. So then they, so then they locked him up again. They put him in a cell in Santa Rita with a guy who had just stabbed three people. And the guy bashed his brains all over the cell, cell and murdered him, okay? That's what sitting laws do to people, okay? That's what these laws do to people. That's the power they want. They want the power. See, it's not about getting the ticket. It's about getting thrown with the worst human beings possible in jail and getting your ass kicked, getting murdered, get, you know, I, getting put in solitary confinement for months at a time. I mean, I, I could go on and on on how many times I've been beaten 
when I think of the people that I've known over the years, that I've seen come out of Santa Rita with their eyes out to here and their arms in slings, it just makes me want to throw up. And that's what they want to do more of. And that's ridiculous. And I'll always fight that. You know, it's bad enough being poor, being homeless, being broke out in the streets, but then you got to go get a beating for it. It's ridiculous. You know, and then once you get caught in the Dr. Cody world, forget about it. You know, they, they, they send you to jail. They come in and say, yeah, he, uh, he didn't show up at our meeting. And blah, 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 blah. You know, they want you to go to a meeting. You got to be there at, I guess, 8 o'clock in the morning. And then, it's funny, she always says, her husband, she married one of the people that were going to her meetings. And she goes, well, my husband went through it. Yeah, when her husband went through it, it was a 40-day program. Now it's like over a year that you got to be in the program, okay? So don't tell me how your husband went through it, okay? And she was sweet on him, so he could do whatever he wanted anyway. And, and are you supposed to marry your clients? I don't think so, but that's another thing we should look into. But, um, so, you know, if, if you don't show up to one of her things, she just tells the judge, oh, he's not cooperating, blah, 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 and they throw you in jail. So, I mean, you know, they got you, you know? I went to court... I mean, I went to the city hall, the city hall, because they were asking for two hundred thousand dollars. All right, two hundred thousand dollars that could be spent on homeless people. They wanted to suck up two hundred thousand dollars from the city. Okay, and I went to court a, a, against that. Two days later, I got a warrant for my arrest in the mail. Two days later, some stupid thing months ago that they said, "Don't worry about it. We threw it out." They brought it back up and they brought me to court. And if I didn't show up to court with 20 people that day, they would have rammed me good. All right, but I brought all kind. I brought three lawyers and all kinds of activists with me. And, and actually, all and they went, "Oh, this is just some mistake. I'm sorry about that." And, and threw it away as fast as they could. But if I went in there by myself, I'd still be in jail. Yes, on S says that no on S proposes no better solutions. Do you? The first thing I would do is get rid of options recovery, okay? And those idiot ambassadors. I went down the street the other day. I had me, my wife, my two little kids, and this guy comes by in a, in a uh, green shirt like this, and he like almost pushed my kid over, and I was I was I, I was gonna get out of my chair and kick his ass. And then I look, and it says Berkeley ambassador on his shirt. I go, that's, what this, that's an ambassador? They don't do anything. I've never seen them stop and talk to one person to help them. Never. I went up there to give them a, just to try them out. I went, excuse me, you know, I'm homeless. Like, is there anything, you know, you know that, that I, I could take advantage of, you know, to get off the streets? And the guy goes, no, nah, there's really not much going on right now, man. Uh, you know, most of the shelters are full. And kept his, he was talking to somebody else and just kept talking to the other person. You know, that, they don't do anything for anybody. That guy could care less if I was having problems. About, it's been about six or seven years ago we got a rain shelter started in Berkeley, mm -hmm. but it's a lot of times it's not handicapped access, accessible, mm -hmm. so I think that's a problem. We don't really have anything for disabled people. They get you up at six o'clock in the morning, and then you either you got to take everything with you, or they lock your stuff up all day. So if I was to get like an artificial leg, and need to take it off in the middle of the day and, and change. I couldn't do that if I was in a shelter. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's just so many diff so many ways that they make it nearly impossible. And then, you know, they go, hey, get out of here at 6 o'clock in the morning, and what are you, where are you going to go? You're going to go mm -hmm. sit out on a sidewalk mm -hmm. somewhere, right? right? And they're going to make that illegal next. So now, now what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. You know, they're just trying to make it more and more difficult for people to survive. So. I would make the shelters accessible, like tw you know, 24 hours a day, mm -hmm. you know, so people can get in and out and, and kind of live like normally, mm -hmm. and 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 have a little more privacy. That, because if you go to go, have you been to the shelter here? It looks like a jail. It is a jail, mm -hmm. and you know it has bars and everything. You know they roll the bars up and down, and they you know they put you in there on these bunks with other people. I mean, it's scarier to be in there than it is to sleep out in the streets. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I would change that whole system if I could. Um, I would definitely make it easier for people to eat. I, I'd make it easier. 
easier for people to have transportation. You know, once you fall past a certain level in homelessness, it's almost impossible to get up out of there. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, your, your clothes are ratty, your, you know, you, you can't shower all the time, you know, your hair looks funky, you know, people look at you and they're like, I'm not going to rent this guy a place to, are you kidding? You know, I'm not going to give this guy a job. Who would want this guy in my in my shop? I don't even want him in here right now. Get out. You know, and, you know, so once you, you know, we got to keep people from falling past that point.